Theravada, Pali, lit. School of the Elders, is the most ancient branch of extant Buddhism today, and the one that preserved their version of the teachings of Gautama Buddha in the Pali Canon. The Pali Canon is the only complete Buddhist canon which survives in a classical Indian language, Pali, which serves as both sacred language and lingua franca of Theravada Buddhism. For more than a millennium, Theravada has focused on preserving the Dhamma as preserved in its texts, and it tends to be very conservative with regard to matters of doctrine and monastic discipline. Since the 19th century, meditation practice has been reintroduced, and has become popular with a lay audience, both in traditional Theravada countries and in the West. As a distinct school of early Buddhism, Theravada Buddhism developed in Sri Lanka and subsequently spread to the rest of Southeast Asia. It is the dominant form of religion in Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, Sri Lanka, and Thailand, and is practiced by minority groups in India, Bangladesh, China, Nepal, and Vietnam. In addition, the diaspora of all of these groups as well as converts around the world practice Theravada Buddhism. Contemporary expressions include Buddhist modernism, the Vipassana movement, and the Thai forest tradition. History Origins <inaudible> 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 The name Theravada comes from the ancestral Stavriya, one of the early Buddhist schools, from which the Theravadins claim descent. The Stavira Nikaya arose during the first schism in the Buddhist Sangha, due to their desire to tighten monastic discipline by adding new Vinaya rules, against the wishes of the majority Mahasamgika group who disagreed with this. According to its own accounts, the Theravada school is fundamentally derived from the Vibhajavada doctrine of analysis grouping, which was a division of the Stavariya. According to Damien Keown, there is no historical evidence that the Theravada school arose until around two centuries after the Great Schism which occurred at the Third Council. Theravadan accounts of its own origins mention that it received the teachings that were agreed upon during the putative Third Buddhist Council under the patronage of the Indian Emperor Ashoka around 250 BCE. These teachings were known as the Vibhajavada. Emperor Ashoka is supposed to have assisted in purifying the Sangha by expelling monks who failed to agree to the terms of Third Council. The elder monk Magaliputta Tissa was at the head of the Third Council and compiled the Kathavathu, points of controversy, a refutation of various opposing views which is an important work in the Theravada Abhidhamma. Later, the Vibhajavadins in turn is said to have split into four groups, the Mahisasaka, Kasyapaya, Dharmaguptaka in the north, and the Tamraparnia in South India. The Tambapaniya later Mahaviharavasans, were established in Sri Lanka at Anuradhapura but active also in Andhra and other parts of South India Vanavasa in modern Karnataka and later across Southeast Asia. Inscriptional evidence of this school has been found in Amravati and Nagarjunakanda. According to Buddhist scholar A. K. Warder, the Theravada, spread rapidly south from Avanti into Maharashtra and Andhra and down to the Chola country Kanshi, as well as Sri Lanka. For some time they maintained themselves in Avanti as well as in their new territories, but gradually they tended to regroup themselves in the south, the great Vihara Mahavihara in Anuradhapura, the ancient capital of Sri Lanka, becoming the main centre of their tradition, Kanchi a secondary centre and the northern regions apparently relinquished to other schools. Topic. Transmission to Sri Lanka 
The Theravada is said to be descended from the Tamraparnia sect, which means, the Sri Lankan lineage. Missionaries sent abroad from India are said to have included Ashoka's son Mahinda who studied under Magaliputta Tissa and his daughter Sangamita, and they were the mythical founders of Buddhism in Sri Lanka, a story which scholars suggest helps to legitimize Theravada's claims of being the oldest and most authentic school. According to the Mahavamsa chronicle their arrival in Sri Lanka is said to have been during the reign of Devanampiya Tissa of Anuradhapura who converted to Buddhism and helped build the first Buddhist stupas. According to S. D. Bandaranayaki, the rapid spread of Buddhism and the emergence of an extensive organization of the Sangha are closely linked with the secular authority of the central state. There are no known artistic or architectural remains from this epoch except for the cave dwellings of the monks, reflecting the growth and spread of the new religion. The most distinctive features of this phase and virtually the only contemporary historical material, are the numerous Brahmi inscriptions associated with these caves. They record gifts to the Sangha, significantly by householders and chiefs rather than by kings. The Buddhist religion itself does not seem to have established undisputed authority until the reigns of Dutthagamani and Vatagamani c. mid-2nd century BCE to mid-1st century BCE. The first records of Buddha images come from the reign of King Vasaba 65-109 BCE, and after the 3rd century AD the historical record shows a growth of the worship of Buddha images as well as bodhisattvas. In the 7th century, the Chinese pilgrim monks Xuanzang and Yijing refer to the Buddhist schools in Sri Lanka as Shangzobu Chinese, Shangzuobu corresponding to the Sanskrit Stavira Nikaya and Pali Thera Nikaya. Yijing writes in Sri Lanka the Stavira school alone flourishes, the Mahasangikas are expelled. The school has been using the name Theravada for itself in a written form since at least the 4th century, about 1,000 years after the Buddha's death, when the term appears in the Dipavamsa, between the reigns of Sena I and Mahinda IV the city of Anuradhapura saw a colossal building effort by various kings during a long period of peace and prosperity, the great part of the present architectural remains in this city date from this period. <laughs> <laughs> Development of the Pali textual tradition The Sri Lankan Buddhist Sangha initially preserved the Buddhist scriptures the Tipitaka orally as it had been traditionally done, however during the 1st century BCE, famine and wars led to the writing down of these scriptures. The Sri Lankan chronicle the Mahavamsa records, "...formerly clever monks preserved the text of the canon and its commentaries orally." But then, when they saw the disastrous state of living beings, they came together and had it written down in books, that the doctrine might long survive." According to Richard Gombrich this is, "...the earliest record we have of Buddhist scriptures being committed to writing anywhere." The Theravada Pali texts which have survived with only a few exceptions are derived from the Mahavihara monastic complex of Anuradhapura, the ancient Sri Lankan capital. Later developments included the formation and recording of the Theravada commentary literature at the Katha. The Theravada tradition records that even during the early days of Mahinda, there was already a tradition of Indian commentaries on the scriptures. Prior to the writing of the classic Theravada Pali commentaries, there were also various commentaries on the Tipitaka written in the Sinhalese language, such as the Maha Atthakatha. 
great commentary. The main commentary tradition of the Mahavihara monks, of great importance to the commentary tradition is the work of the great Theravada scholastic Buddhaghosa 4th-5th century CE, who is responsible for most of the Theravada commentarial literature that has survived any older commentaries have been lost. Buddhaghosa wrote in Pali, and after him, most Sri Lankan Buddhist scholastics did as well. This allowed the Sri Lankan tradition to become more international through a lingua franca so as to converse with monks in India and later Southeast Asia. Theravada monks also produced other Pali literature such as historical chronicles e.g. Mahavamsa, hagiographies, practice manuals, summaries, textbooks, poetry and Abhidhamma works such as the Abhidhamatha Sangaha and the Abhidhamavatara. Buddhaghosa's work on Abhidhamma and Buddhist practice outlined in works such as the Visuddhimagga and the Atthasalini are the most influential texts apart from the Pali Canon in the Theravada tradition. Other Theravada Pali commentators and writers include Dhammapala and Buddhadatta. Dhammapala wrote commentaries on the Pali Canon texts which Buddhaghosa had omitted and also wrote a commentary called the Paramathamanjusa on Buddhaghosa's Visuddhimagga. <laughs> Sri Lankan Theravada sects Over much of the early history of Buddhism in Sri Lanka, there were three subdivisions of Theravada, consisting of the monks of the Mahavihara, Abhyagiri Vihara and Jetavana, each of which were based in Anuradhapura. The Mahavihara was the first tradition to be established, while Abhyagiri Vihara and Jetavana Vihara were established by monks who had broken away from the Mahavihara tradition. According to A. K. Warder, the Indian Mahisasaka sect also established itself in Sri Lanka alongside the Theravada, into which they were later absorbed. Northern regions of Sri Lanka also seem to have been ceded to sects from India at certain times. When the Chinese monk Faxian visited the island in the early 5th century, he noted 5,000 monks at Abhyagiri, 3,000 at the Mahavihara, and 2,000 at the Siddhapabhate Vihara. The Mahavihara Great Monastery. School became dominant in Sri Lanka at the beginning of the second millennium CE and gradually spread through mainland Southeast Asia. It was established in Myanmar in the late 11th century, in Thailand in the 13th and early 14th centuries, and in Cambodia and Laos by the end of the 14th century. Although Mahavihara never completely replaced other schools in Southeast Asia, it received special favor at most royal courts. This is due to the support it received from local elites, who exerted a very strong religious and social influence. <laughs> Mahayana influence Over the centuries, the Abhyagiri Theravadins maintained close relations with Indian Buddhists and adopted many new teachings from India, including many elements from Mahayana teachings, while the Jetavana Theravadins adopted Mahayana to a lesser extent. Xuanzang wrote of two major divisions of Theravada in Sri Lanka, referring to the Abhyagiri tradition as the Mahayana Staviras and the Mahavihara tradition as the Hinayana Staviras. Xuanzang also wrote that the Mahaviharavasins reject the Mahayana as heretical, while the Abhyagiraviharavasins study both Hinayana and Mahayana. Abhyagiri was an influential university and center for the study of Mahayana from the reign of Gajabahu I until the 12th century. It saw various important Buddhist scholars working in Sanskrit and Pali. 
These include Upatisa, who wrote the Vimitimaga, Kavachakravarti Ananda, authored the Sadhamopayana, Aryadeva, Aryasura, and the Tantric masters Jayabhadra, and Kandramali. Akira Hirakawa notes that the surviving Pali commentaries at the Katha of the Mahavihara school, when examined closely, also include a number of positions that agree with Mahayana teachings. Kalupahana notes the same for the Visuddhimagga, the most important Theravada commentary. It is known that in the 8th century, both Mahayana and the esoteric Vajrayana form of Buddhism were being practiced in Sri Lanka, and two Indian monks responsible for propagating esoteric Buddhism in China, Vajrabodhi and Amogavajra, visited the island during this time. Abhyagiri Vihara appears to have been a center for Theravadan Mahayana and Vajrayana teachings. <inaudible> Reign of Parakramabahu I The trend of the Abhyagiri Vihara being a dominant sect changed in the 12th century, when the Mahavihara sect gained the political support of Parakramabahu I who completely abolished the Abhyagiri and Jetavanan traditions. The Theravada monks of these two traditions were defrocked and given the choice of either returning to the laity permanently, or attempting reordination under the Mahavihara tradition as novices. Samanera. Richard Gombrich writes, Though the Chronicle says that he reunited the Sangha, this expression glosses over the fact that what he did was to abolish the Abhyagiri and Jetavana Nikayas. He laicized many monks from the Maha Vihara Nikaya, all the monks in the other two, and then allowed the better ones among the latter to become novices in the now unified Sangha, into which they would have in due course to be reordained. It seems that part of the reason for these radical moves was that Parakramabahu I saw the Sangha as being divided, corrupt, and in need of reform, especially the Abhyagiri. The Kulavamsa laments that at this time Theravada monks had "...turned away in their demeanour from one another and took delight in all kinds of strife." This chronicle also claims that many monks in the Sri Lankan Sangha had even begun to marry and have children, behaving more like lay followers than monastics. Parakramabahu's chief monastic leader in these reforms was Mahathera Kasapa, an experienced monk well versed in the scriptures and the monastic discipline. Parakramabahu I is also known for rebuilding the ancient cities of Anuradhapura and Palanarua, restoring Buddhist stupas and viharas. Monasteries. He appointed a Sangharaha, or king of the Sangha. A monk who would preside over the Sangha and its ordinations in Sri Lanka, assisted by two deputies. The reign of Parakamabahu also saw a flowering of Theravada scholasticism with the work of prominent Sri Lankan scholars such as Aniruddha, Sariputta Thera, Mahakasapa Thera of Dimbulagala Vihara, and Magalana Thera. They worked on compiling of subcommentaries on the Tipitaka, texts on grammar, summaries and textbooks on Abhidhamma and Vinaya such as the influential Abhidhamatha Sangaha of Aniruddha. <laughs> <laughs> Spread to Southeast Asia According to the Mahavamsa, a Sri Lankan chronicle, after the conclusion of the Third Buddhist Council, a mission was sent to Suwanapum, led by two monks, Sona and Uttara. Scholarly opinions differ as to where exactly this land of Suwanapum was located, but it is generally believed to have been located somewhere in the area of Lower Burma, Thailand, the Malay Peninsula, or Sumatra. Before the 12th century, the areas of Thailand, Myanmar, Laos, and Cambodia were dominated by Buddhist sects from India, and included the teachings of Mahayana Buddhism. 
In the 7th century, Yijing noted in his travels that in these areas, all major sects of Indian Buddhism flourished. Topic. Myanmar Though there are some early accounts that have been interpreted as Theravada in Myanmar, the surviving records show that most Burmese Buddhism incorporated Mahayana, and used Sanskrit rather than Pali. After the decline of Buddhism in India, missions of monks from Sri Lanka gradually converted Burmese Buddhism to Theravada, and in the next two centuries also brought Theravada Buddhism to the areas of Thailand, Laos, and Cambodia, where it supplanted previous forms of Buddhism. The Mon and Pyu were among the earliest people to inhabit Myanmar. The oldest surviving Buddhist texts in the Pali language come from Pyu city state of Sri K. Setra. The text, which is dated from the mid 5th to mid 6th century, is written on 20 leaf manuscript of solid gold. Peter Skilling concludes that there is firm evidence for the dominant presence of Theravada in the Irrawaddy and Chow Freya basins, from about the 5th century CE onwards though he adds that evidence shows that Mahayana was also present, the Burmese slowly became Theravadan as they came into contact and conquered the Pyu and Mon civilizations. This began in the 11th century during the reign of the Bamar king Anuradha of the pagan kingdom who acquired the Pali scriptures in a war against the Mon as well as from Sri Lanka and built stupas and monasteries at his capital of Bagan. Various invasions of Burma by neighbouring states and the Mongol invasions of Burma 13th century damaged the Burmese Sangha and Theravada had to be reintroduced several times into the country from Sri Lanka and Thailand. <laughs> <laughs> Cambodia and Thailand The Khmer Empire centered in Cambodia was initially dominated by Hinduism, Hindu ceremonies and rituals were performed by Brahmins, usually only held among ruling elites of the king's family, nobles, and the ruling class. Tantric Mahayana Buddhism was also a prominent faith, promoted by Buddhist emperors such as Jayavarman VII who rejected the Hindu gods and presented himself as a bodhisattva king. During his reign, King Jayavarman VII sent his son Tamalinda to Sri Lanka to be ordained as a Buddhist monk and study Theravada Buddhism according to the Pali scriptural traditions in the Mahavihara monastery. Tamalinda then returned to Cambodia and promoted Buddhist traditions according to the Theravada training he had received, galvanizing and energizing the long-standing Theravada presence that had existed throughout the Angkor Empire for centuries. During the 13th and 14th centuries, Theravada monks from Sri Lanka continued introducing Orthodox Theravada Buddhism which eventually became the dominant faith among all classes. The monasteries replaced the local priestly classes, becoming centers of religion, education, culture and social service for Cambodian villages. This change in Cambodian Buddhism led to high levels of literacy among Cambodians. In Thailand, Theravada existed alongside Mahayana and other religious sects before the rise of Sukhothai Kingdom. During the reign of King Ram Khamhaeng, c. 1237-1247-1298. Theravada was made the main state religion and promoted by the king as the orthodox form of Thai Buddhism. Despite its success in Southeast Asia, Theravada Buddhism in China has generally been limited to areas bordering Theravada countries. Topic: <laughs> Tantric and Esoteric Innovations. 
During the pre modern era, Southeast Asian Buddhism included numerous elements which could be called tantric and esoteric, such as the use of mantras and yantras in elaborate rituals. The French scholar Francois Bizot has called this tantric Theravada, and his textual studies show that it was a major tradition in Cambodia and Thailand. Some of these practices are still prevalent in Cambodia and Laos today. Later Theravada textual materials show new and somewhat unorthodox developments in theory and practice. These developments include what has been called the Yogavacara tradition, associated with the Sinhalese Yogavacara's manual, c. 16th to 17th centuries, and also esoteric Theravada, also known as Boran Kamatana, ancient practices. These traditions include new practices and ideas which are not included in classical orthodox Theravada works like the Visuddhimagga, such as the use of mantras such as Araham, the practice of magical formulas, complex rituals and complex visualization exercises. These practices were particularly prominent in the Siam Nikaya before the modernist reforms of King Rama IV (1851–1868), as well as in Sri Lanka. Topic: <laughs> Modernization and spread to the West. In the 19th century began a process of mutual influence of both Asian Buddhists and Hinduists, and a Western audience interested in ancient wisdom. Theravada was also influenced by this process, which lead to Buddhist modernism, especially Helena Blavatsky and Henry Steele Alcott, founders of the Theosophical Society, had a profound role in this process in Sri Lanka. Simultaneously, vipassana meditation was reinvented, and in Theravada countries a lay vipassana practice developed. This took a high flight in East Asia from the 1950s onwards with the vipassana movement, and from the 1970s also in the West, with Western students who popularized vipassana meditation in the West, giving way to the development and popularization of mindfulness practice. Topic. Reaction against Western colonialism Buddhist revivalism has also reacted against changes in Buddhism caused by colonialist regimes. Western colonialists and Christian missionaries deliberately imposed a particular type of Christian monasticism on Buddhist clergy in Sri Lanka and colonies in Southeast Asia, restricting monks' activities to individual purification and temple ministries. Prior to British colonial control, monks in both Sri Lanka and Burma had been responsible for the education of the children of lay people, and had produced large bodies of literature. After the British takeover, Buddhist temples were strictly administered and were only permitted to use their funds on strictly religious activities. Christian ministers were given control of the education system and their pay became state funding for missions. Foreign, especially British, rule had an enervating effect on the Sangha. According to Walpola Rahula, Christian missionaries displaced and appropriated the educational, social, and welfare activities of the monks, and inculcated a permanent shift in views regarding the proper position of monks in society through their institutional influence upon the elite. Many monks in post-colonial times have dedicated themselves to undoing these changes. Movements intending to restore Buddhism's place in society have developed in both Sri Lanka and Myanmar. One consequence of the reaction against Western colonialism has been a modernization of Theravada Buddhism. Western elements have been incorporated, and meditation practice has opened to a lay audience. Modernized forms of Theravadan practice have spread to the West. 
Topic: Sri Lanka. In Sri Lanka Theravadins were looking at Western culture to find means to revitalize their own tradition. Christian missionaries were threatening the indigenous culture. As a reaction to this, Theravadins became active in spreading Buddhism and debating Christians. They were aided by the Theosophical Society, who were dedicated to the search for wisdom within ancient sources. Anagarika Dharmapala was one of the Theravada leaders with whom the Theosophists sided. Dharmapala reached out to the middle classes, offering them religious practice and a religious identity, which were used to withstand the British imperialists. As a result of Dharmapala's efforts, lay practitioners started to practice meditation and study Buddhism, which had been reserved specifically for the monks. The translation and publication of the Pali Canon by the Pali Text Society made the Pali Canon better available to a lay audience, not only in the West, but also in the East. Western lay interest in Theravada Buddhism was promoted by the Theosophical Society, and endured until the beginning of the 20th century. During the 1970s interest rose again, leading to a surge of Westerners searching for enlightenment, and the republishing of the Pali Canon, first in print, and later on the Internet. Myanmar. <inaudible> <inaudible> An influential modernist figure in Myanmar Buddhism was King Minden Min (1808–1878). He promoted the Fifth Buddhist Council (1871) and inscribed the Pali Canon into marble slabs, creating the world's largest book in 1868. During his reign, various reformist sects came into being such as the Dwaya and the Shwegian, who advocated a stricter monastic conduct than the mainstream Thudhamma tradition. During colonial Burma, there were constant tensions between Christian missionaries and Buddhist monks which included one of the first Western convert monks, U Damaloka. After independence, Myanmar was also the place for the Sixth Buddhist Council Vesak 1954 to Vesak 1956 which was attended by monks from eight Theravada nations to recite the Pali Canon. The council synthesized a new redaction of the Pali texts ultimately transcribed into several native scripts. In Myanmar, this Chattha Sangiti Pataka, Sixth Council Pataka was published by the government in 40 volumes. Modern vipassana meditation practice was reinvented in Myanmar in the 19th century. The New Burmese Method was developed by U Narada and popularized by his student Mahasi Sayada and Nyanaponika Thera. Another prominent teacher is Bhikkhu Bodhi, a student of Nyanaponika. The New Burmese method strongly emphasizes vipassana over samatha. It is regarded by traditionalists as a simplification of traditional Buddhist meditation techniques, suitable not only for monks but also for lay practitioners. The method has been popularized in the West by teachers of the Vipassana movement such as Joseph Goldstein, Jack Kornfield, Tara Brach, Gil Fronsdal and Sharon Salzberg. The Ledi lineage begins with Ledi Sayadaw. S. N. Goenka is a well-known teacher in the Ledi lineage. According to S. N. Goenka, Vipassana techniques are essentially non-sectarian in character, and have universal application. Meditation centers teaching the Vipassana popularized by S. N. Goenka exist now in India, Asia, North and South America, Europe, Australia, Middle East and Africa. Thailand and Cambodia 
With the coming to power in 1851 of King Mongkut, who had been a monk himself for 27 years, the Sangha, like the kingdom, became steadily more centralized and hierarchical, and its links to the state more institutionalized. Mongkut was a distinguished scholar of Pali Buddhist scripture. Moreover, at that time the immigration of numbers of monks from Burma was introducing the more rigorous discipline characteristic of the Mon Sangha. Influenced by the Mon and guided by his own understanding of the Tipitaka, Mongkut began a reform movement that later became the basis for the Dhammayutika Nikaya. Mongkut advocated a stricter adherence to the Vinaya monastic discipline. He also emphasized study of the scriptures, and rationalism. His son King Chulalongkorn created a national structure for Buddhist monastics and established a nationwide system of monastic education. In the early 1900s, Thailand's Ajahn Sao Kantasilo and his student, Moon Buridatta, led the Thai forest tradition revival movement. In the 20th century notable practitioners included Ajahn Thait, Ajahn Maha Bua and Ajahn Cha. It was later spread globally by Ajahn Moon's students including Ajahn Thait, Ajahn Maha Bua and Ajahn Cha and several Western disciples, among whom the most senior is Luang Por Ajahn Sumido. Modern Buddhism in Cambodia was strongly influenced by Thai Buddhism. The Dhammayutika Nikaya was introduced into the country during the reign of King Norodom (1834–1904) and benefited from royal patronage. The rule of the Khmer Rouge effectively destroyed Cambodia's Buddhist institutions by disrobing and killing monks and destroying temples. After the end of the regime, the Sangha was re-established. An important figure of modern Cambodian Theravada is Maha Gosananda who promoted a form of engaged Buddhism to effect social change. <laughs> <laughs> modern developments The following modern trends or movements have been identified. Modernism, attempts to adapt to the modern world and adopt some of its ideas, including, among other things Green movement, ecological work Syncretism with other Buddhist as well as Hindu in Sri Lanka, India, Nepal, Bali and Thailand traditions Universal inclusivity Reformism, attempts to restore a supposed earlier, ideal state of Buddhism, includes in particular the adoption of Western scholars' theories of original Buddhism in recent times the "...Western scholarly interpretation of Buddhism," is the official Buddhism prevailing in Sri Lanka and Thailand. Ultimatism, tendency to concentrate on advanced teachings such as the Four Noble Truths at the expense of more elementary ones. Neotraditionalism, includes among other things. Revival of ritualism Remythologization Social and political action, including engaged Buddhism, protesting and participating in election politics. Devotional religiosity Reaction to Buddhist nationalism Renewal of forest monks Revival of meditation practice by monks and laypersons, emphasizing meditation centers and retreats. Ledi Sayadaw is particular important in this regard. Revival of the Theravada bhikkhuni female monastic lineage not recognized by some male Sangha authorities. Convert Buddhism in Western countries, establishment of Western monastic orders especially the Thai forest tradition and development of Pali scholarship in Western languages. Texts. Topic. 
Poly Cannon According to Kate Crosby, for Theravada, the Pali Canon is the highest authority on what constitutes the Dhamma, the truth or teaching of the Buddha, and the organization of the Sangha, the community of monks and nuns. The Sutta and Vinaya portion of the Tipitaka shows considerable overlap in content to the Agamas, the parallel collections used by non Theravada schools in India, which are preserved in Chinese and partially in Sanskrit, Prakrit, and Tibetan, and the various non Theravada Vinayas. On this basis, both these sets of texts are generally believed to be the oldest and most authoritative texts on pre-sectarian Buddhism by scholars. It is also believed that much of the Pali Canon, which is still used by Theravada communities, was transmitted to Sri Lanka during the reign of Ashoka. After being orally transmitted as was the custom in those days for religious texts for some centuries, were finally committed to writing in the last century BCE, at what the Theravada usually reckons as the Fourth Council, in Sri Lanka. Theravada is one of the first Buddhist schools to commit the whole complete set of its Buddhist canon into writing. Much of the material in the canon is not specifically Theravadin, but is instead the collection of teachings that this school preserved from the early, non sectarian body of teachings. According to Peter Harvey, the Theravadins, then, may have added texts to the canon for some time, but they do not appear to have tampered with what they already had from an earlier period. The Pali Tipitaka consists of three parts, the Vinaya Pitaka, Sutta Pitaka and Abhidhamma Pitaka. Of these, the Abhidhamma Pitaka is believed to be a later addition to the first two Pitakas, which, in the opinion of many scholars, were the only two Pitakas at the time of the First Buddhist Council. The Pali Abhidhamma was not recognized outside the Theravada school. The Tipitaka is composed of 45 volumes in the Thai edition, 40 in the Burmese and 58 in the Sinhalese, and a full set of the Tipitaka is usually kept in its own medium-sized cupboard. Topic: <inaudible> Vinaya, monastic discipline and Abhidhamma. According to Kate Crosby, since much Sutta material overlaps with that found in the sutra collections of other Buddhist traditions, it is the Vinaya monastic discipline and Abhidhamma that are the most distinctive formal aspects of Theravada Buddhism, unique to Theravada, the Vibhajavada school the analysts, the branch of the Stavira school from which Theravada is derived, differed from other early Buddhist schools on a variety of teachings. The differences resulted from the systematization of the Buddhist teachings, which was preserved in the Abhidharmas of the various schools. The unique doctrinal positions of the Theravada school are expounded in what is known as the Abhidhamma Pitaka, as well as in the later Pali commentaries at the Katha and sub-commentaries because of the size of this canonical and commentarial literature the Pali tradition developed a tradition of handbooks and doctrinal summaries, the most influential of which are the Visuddhimagga and the Abhidhamma The Pali Abhidhamma is, "...a restatement of the doctrine of the Buddha in strictly formalized language." assumed to constitute a consistent system of philosophy. Its aim is not the empirical verification of the Buddhist teachings, but to set forth the correct interpretation of the Buddha's statements in the sutra to restate his system with perfect accuracy. 
Because Abhidhamma focuses on analyzing the internal lived experience of beings and the intentional structure of consciousness, the system has often been compared to a kind of phenomenological psychology by numerous scholars such as Nyanaponika, Bhikkhu Bodhi, and Alexander Piatagorsky. The Theravada school has traditionally held the doctrinal position that the canonical Abhidhamma Pitaka was actually taught by the Buddha himself. Modern scholarship in contrast, has generally held that the Abhidhamma texts date from the 3rd century BCE. However some scholars, such as Frau Wallner, also hold that the early Abhidhamma texts developed out of exegetical and catechetical work which made use of doctrinal lists which can be seen in the suttas, called matikas. Topic: Non-canonical literature. In the fourth or fifth century, Buddhaghosa Thera wrote the first Pali commentaries to much of the Tipitaka, which were based on much older manuscripts, mostly in Old Sinhalese, including commentaries on the Nikayas and his commentary on the Vinaya, the Samantapasadika. Buddhaghosa wrote as part of the Mahavihara tradition in Sri Lanka, a tradition which came to dominate the island and all of Theravada after the 12th century. After him, many other monks wrote various texts which have become part of the Theravada heritage. These texts do not have the same authority as the Tipitaka does, though Buddhaghosa's Visuddhimagga is a cornerstone of the commentarial tradition. Another important genre of Theravada literature are shorter handbooks and summaries which serve as introductions and study guides for the larger commentarial works. Two of the more influential summaries are Sariputta Thera's Palamuttakavanaya Vinichayasangaha, a summary of Buddhaghosa's Vinaya commentary, and Aniruddha's Abhidhamma Dasangaha, Manual of Abhidhamma. For many Theravada Buddhists, the Pali texts and language are symbolically and ritually important. However, most people are likely to access Buddhist teachings, though vernacular literature, oral teachings, sermons, art, and performance as well as films and internet media. According to Kate Crosby, "...there is a far greater volume of Theravada literature in vernacular languages than in Pali." An important genre of Theravada literature, in both Pali and vernacular languages are the Jataka tales, stories of the Buddha's past lives. They are very popular among all classes and are rendered in a wide variety of media formats, from cartoons to high literature. The Vesantara Jataka is one of the most popular of these. Theravada Buddhists consider much of what is found in the Chinese and Tibetan Mahayana scriptural collections to be apocryphal, meaning that they are not authentic words of the Buddha. Topic. Study pariyati. Theravada traditionally promotes itself as the Vibhajavada teaching of analysis. This doctrine says that insight must come from the aspirant's experience, application of knowledge, and critical reasoning. However, the scriptures of the Theravadan tradition also emphasize heeding the advice of the wise, considering such advice and evaluation of one's own experiences to be the two tests by which practices should be judged. Yet, in its actual praxis, according to Braun, the majority of Theravadins and dedicated Buddhists of other traditions, including monks and nuns, have focused on cultivating moral behavior, preserving the Buddha's teachings dharma, and acquiring the good karma that comes from generous giving. Topic. Core doctrines. The core of Theravada doctrine is contained in the Pali Canon, the only complete collection of early Buddhist texts surviving in a classical Indic language. These ideas are shared by other early Buddhist schools as well as by Mahayana traditions. 
They include central concepts such as the Middle Way, the Four Noble Truths, the Noble Eightfold Path, Three Marks of Existence, Impermanence, Suffering, Not Self, Five Aggregates, Dependent Arising, Karma and Rebirth, Jhana. The Bodhipakyadama, 37 factors conducive to awakening. Kleshas, mental defilements and asavas. Avidya, ignorance. Nirvana. Topic: <laughs> Dhamma theory. In the Pali Nikayas, the Buddha teaches through a method in which experience is explained using various conceptual groupings of physical and mental processes, which are called dhammas. Examples of lists of dhammas taught by the Buddha include the twelve sense spheres or ayatanas, the five aggregates or khanda and the eighteen elements of cognition or dhatis. Expanding this model, the Pali Abhidhamma concerned itself with analyzing ultimate truth, paramatha sakha, which it sees as being composed of all possible dhammas and their relationships. The central theory of the Pali Abhidhamma is thus known as the Dhamma theory. Topic: <laughs> Characteristics. Dhamma has been translated as factors. Call it Cox, psychic characteristics. Bronckhorst, psychophysical events. Noah Ronkin and phenomena. Nyanaponika Thera. Dhammas are defined by the Theravada commentary, the Athasalini, as Dhammas bear their own particular natures. Alternatively, Dhammas are born by conditions, or according to particular natures. According to Y. Karunadasa, a Dhamma, which can be translated as a principle or element dharma is those items that result when the process of analysis is taken to its ultimate limits however this does not mean that they have an independent existence for it is only for the purposes of description that they are postulated noah ronkin defines dhammas as the constituents of sentient experience, the irreducible building blocks that make up one's world, albeit they are not static mental contents and certainly not substances. Noah Ronkin also argues that there was gradual shift from the early canonical texts which tended to explain experience in terms of changing processes, to the Abhidhamma tradition which analyzed these processes into distinct mental events. Dhammas are not permanent, discrete and separate entities, they are always independently conditioned relationships with other dhammas and always changing, arising and vanishing. It is thus only for the sake of description that they are said to have their own nature. Sabhava. Alternatively, Theravada commentaries sometimes equate the two terms, such as the Visuddhimagga, which states that Dhamma means Sabhava. According to Peter Harvey, the Theravada view of a Dhamma's Sabhava is that it refers to an individualizing characteristic salakana that is not something inherent in a dhamma as a separate ultimate reality, but arise due to the supporting conditions both of other dhammas and previous occurrences of that dhamma. Noah Ronkin argues that in Theravada Abhidhamma, sabhava is predominantly used for the sake of determining the dhamma's individuality, not their existential status. Ronkin also adds, the concept of sabhava attests to the Theravadin's interest in unveiling the nature of conscious experience, this, they presumed, could be carried out by enumerating the possible types of those events constituting one's experience and by individuating them. 
To individuate the Dhammas the Abhidhamikas had to provide a method for determining what any given Dhammic instance of every possible event type is and what makes it so, and for this purpose they used the concept of Sabhava, thus, while in Theravada Abhidhamma, Dhammas are the ultimate constituents of experience, they are not seen as substances, essences or independent particulars, since they are empty of a self and conditioned. This is spelled out in the Patisambhidamaga, which states that dhammas are empty of svabhava .According to Ronkin, the canonical Pali Abhidhamma remains pragmatic and psychological, and does not take much interest in ontology, in contrast with the Sarvastivada tradition. Paul Williams also notes that the Abhidhamma remains focused on the practicalities of insight meditation and leaves ontology relatively unexplored. Ronkin does note, however, that later Theravada sub commentaries do show a doctrinal shift towards ontological realism from the earlier epistemic and practical concerns. Topic. Classification of Dhammas The Theravada Abhidhamma holds that there is a total of 82 possible types of Dhammas, 81 of these are conditioned sankata, while one is unconditioned, which is Nibbana. The 81 conditioned dhammas are divided into three broad categories, consciousness sata, associated mentality and materiality, or physical phenomena rupa. Since no dhamma exists independently, every single dhamma of consciousness, known as a sata, arises associated sampayuta with at least seven mental factors setasikas. In Abhidhamma, all awareness events are thus seen as being characterized by intentionality and never exist in isolation. Much of Abhidhamma philosophy deals with categorizing the different consciousnesses and their accompanying mental factors as well as their conditioned relationships. The mental factors, for example, are divided into Universal mental factors which are basic and rudimentary cognitive functions. Occasional or particular mental factors Unwholesome mental factors accompanied by one or another of the three unwholesome roots, greed, hatred, and delusion. Beautiful mental factors savana setasikas, accompanied by the wholesome roots, non-greed or generosity, non-hatred or loving-kindness, and non-delusion or wisdom. <laughs> Two truths According Y. Karunadasa, for the Theravada, the two truths theory which divides reality into samuti worldly conventions and paramattha ultimate, absolute truths is a doctrinal innovation of the Abhidhamma, but it has its origins in some statements from the early Pali Nikayas. This can mainly be seen in the distinction made in the Angatara Nikaya between statements not truths that are natatha explicit, definitive, and nayatha requiring further explanation. Karunadasa notes that in the Nikayas, no preferential value judgment is made between natatha and nayatha. All that is emphasized is that the two kinds of statement should not be confused. Another early source of this doctrine is the Sangiti Sutta of the Diga Nikaya, which lists four kinds of knowledge, a the direct knowledge of the doctrine dham jnana, b the inductive knowledge of the doctrine in vi jnana, c knowledge of analysis jnana, and knowledge of linguistic conventions samuti jnana. However, in the earlier Nikayas, as opposed to the Abhidhamma, Samuti linguistic conventions is not analyzed down into existence called Paramattha ultimate. 
In the Theravada Abhidhamma, the distinction does arise, referring to, two levels of reality, namely that which is amenable to analysis and that which defies further analysis. The first level is called samuti because it represents conventional or relative truth or what is called consensual reality, and the second is called paramattha because it represents the absolute truth or ultimate reality. Thus, in orthodox Theravada Abhidhamma, when a situation is explained in terms of what cannot be empirically analyzed further into smaller components with different characteristics lakana, that explanation is paramattha sakha ultimate truth, and when it is explained in terms of what is analyzable further due to being dependent on the mind's synthesizing function i.e. panyati, that explanation is samuti sakha truth by convention, which exists in a relative or conventional sense due to mental conception and linguistic construction However, even these ultimate components .e. dhammas, are dependently originated, necessarily co-existent and positionally inseparable Unlike in the Sanskrit-based Buddhist tradition which refer to the conventional truth as samvyarti which has the meaning of concealing or covering, the Pali Abhidhamma term samuti just means human convention and does not have this connotation of an inferior truth hiding a higher truth. Therefore, as pointed out by K. N. Jayatilik, the Theravada version of two truths does not imply that what is true in the one sense is false in the other or even that the one kind of truth is superior to the other." As Karunadasa writes, the distinction between Samuti Saka and Paramatha Saka does not refer to two kinds of truth as such, but to two ways of presenting what is true. Although they are formally introduced as two truths, they are explained as two modes of expressing what is true. They do not represent two degrees of truth, of which one is superior or inferior to the other. Nor do they represent two parallel truths, because of this, in Pali Abhidhamma, even Paramattha Saka is explained through concepts, though the ultimate itself is not a product of the mind's conceptual function panyati, it cannot be explained without the medium of panyati. Furthermore, according to Zhe Fu Quan, the Dhammasangani, does not appear to uphold that dhammas are ultimate realities as against conventional constructs like persons. Quote, this text also states that all dhammas are ways of designation panyati, that all dhammas are ways of interpretation niruti, and that all dhammas are ways of expression adhivakana. Therefore, the canonical Abhidhamma Pitaka does not uphold the interpretation of the two truths as referring to primary ontological realities as seen in the later commentarial Theravada and also in Sarvastivada. <laughs> Doctrinal differences with other Buddhist schools The doctrinal stances of the Theravada school vis a vis other early Buddhist schools is presented in the Pali text known as the Kathavathu, points of controversy, which said to have been compiled by the scholar Magaliputta Tissa, c. 327 to 247 BCE. It includes several philosophical and soteriological matters, including the following. Topic. View of the Arhat Theravadins believe that an awakened Arahant lit, worthy one has an incorruptible nature, unlike other early Buddhist schools like the Mahasamgika who believed Arahants could regress. Theravadins also dispute the idea that an arahant may be lacking in knowledge, or have doubts, or that they could have nocturnal emissions and thus still have some residual fetter of sensuality. 
They also argued against the Uttarapathaka school's view that a layperson could become an arahant and continue to live the household life. Topic. View of the Buddha The Theravada school rejected the view of the Lokottaravada schools which held that even the Buddha's conventional speech was supramundane or transcendental. They also rejected the Proto-Mahayana Docetic view of the Vetulyaka school that the Buddha himself did not teach the Dharma, but that it was taught by his magical creation or phantom, while he himself remained in Tavatimsa heaven. Topic. Insight is sudden and perfect According to the Theravada, progress in understanding comes all at once, insight does not come gradually successively, anapurva, a belief known as subitism. This is reflected in the Theravada account on the four stages of enlightenment, in which the attainment of the four paths appears suddenly and the defilements are rooted out at once. The same stance is taken in the contemporary Vipassana movement, especially the New Burmese method. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Philosophy of Time. On the philosophy of time, the Theravada tradition holds to philosophical presentism, the view that only present moment dhammas exist, against the eternalist view of the Sarvastivadin tradition which held that dhammas exist in all three times, past, present, future. The early Theravadins who compiled the Kathavathu also rejected the doctrine of momentariness SKT, Kasenavada, Pali, Kanavada, upheld by other Buddhist Abhidharma schools like the Sarvastivada, which held that all dhammas lasted for a moment, which for them meant an atomistic unit of time, that is the shortest possible slice of time. According to Noah Ronkin, the Theravadins meanwhile, used the term moment kana, as a simple expression for a short while the dimension of which is not fixed but may be determined by the context." In the Kani Kakatha of the Kathavathu, the Theravadins also argue that, "...only mental phenomena are momentary, whereas material phenomena endure for a stretch of time." <laughs> Rebirth and Bhavanga Regarding the mechanisms of rebirth, Orthodox Theravadins following the Kathavathu, rejected the doctrine of the intermediate state between death and rebirth, holding instead that rebirth is immediate. However, recently some Theravada monks have written in favor of the idea, such as Ven. Balangoda Ananda Maitreya, the doctrine of the Bhavanga, ground of becoming. Condition for existence is an innovation of the Theravada Abhidhamma, where it is a passive mode of consciousness. Sita. According to Rupert Gethin, it is the state in which the mind is said to rest when no active consciousness process is occurring, such as in deep dreamless sleep. It is also said to be a process which conditions the future rebirth consciousness. Topic. Rupa the physical. Orthodox Theravada's position on the nature of the physical rupa is that it is one of the two main dependently originated processes of a person as part of the mind-body complex called nama rupa. However, there is no dualism between these two, they are merely clusters of interacting processes, each depending on the other. As noted by Buddhahosa, Vism. 596, each can only occur, supported by, 
Nisaya the other, they are like a blind man that carries a crippled man, or two sheaves of reeds which lean on each other and support each other. Rupa is mainly defined in terms of the four Mahabuddha, the four primary physical phenomena, solidity literally earth, cohesion literally water, heat literally fire, and motion literally air. In the Pali Abhidhamma, the four primaries began to refer to the irreducible factors or data that make up the physical world. These basic phenomena come together to make up secondary physical phenomena, such as the sense organs. Thus, according to Y. Karunadasa, Pali Buddhism does not deny the existence of the external world and thus is a kind of realism. However, Theravada also follows the view that rupa, like all skandhas, is void sunya, empty rita, and essence less asara. Rupa dhammas are thus not atomic ontological substances and are merely outlined as a pragmatic descriptions of the world of experience. According to Karunadasa, this steers a middle course between the view that all is an absolute unity. Sabam ekatam, and that it is absolute separateness. Sabam putodam. Also, according to Noah Rankin, Theravada Abhidhamma did not incorporate the Northern Buddhist atomistic theory as such into their system. As Karunadasa indicates, the Theravadan canonical texts do not mention the idea of a unitary atom or the term paramanu. Rather, the post-canonical texts employ the term kalapa literally package, which corresponds to the collective atom of the Sarvastivada Vebasika, that is, the smallest material unit that contains the eight elements. Furthermore, the term kalapa for the collective atom only became standard in the sub-commentarial literature and it is not a singular particle, but a collection of rupa dhammas, which are inseparable from each other and always occur simultaneously simultaneously sahajata topic <inaudible> modern trends the modern era saw new developments in theravada scholarship due to the influence of western thought as Donald K. Swearer writes, although monastic education is still grounded in the study of Buddhist texts, doctrine, and the Pali language, the curricula of monastic colleges and universities also reflect subject matter and disciplines associated with Western education. Buddhist modernist trends can be traced to figures like Anagarika Dhammapala and King Mongkut. They promoted a form of Buddhism that was compatible with rationalism and science, and opposed to superstition. Walpola Rahula's, What the Buddha Taught is seen by scholars as an introduction to modernist Buddhist thought and this book continues to be widely used in universities. Another phenomenon is Buddhist philosophers educated in the West, such as K. N. Jayatilik a student of Wittgenstein and Hamalawa Satatisa, going on to write modern works on Buddhist philosophy Early Buddhist Theory of Knowledge, 1963 and Buddhist Ethics, 1987 respectively. The colonial clash with Christianity also led to debates such as the Panadora debate and doctrinal works written in defense of Buddhism or attacking Christian ideas, such as Gunapala Dharmasiris A Buddhist Critique of the Christian Concept of God 1988. Another development has been modern literature promoting socially engaged Buddhism and Buddhist economics from thinkers such as Buddhadasa, Sulak Sivaraksa, Prayud Payudo, Neville Karunatilak and Padmasiri da Silva. Modern scholarship by Western Buddhist monks such as Nyanaponika Thera was also a new development in the modern era. Topic. Practice Patipati Topic. Textual basis 
In the Pali Canon, the path maga or way of Buddhist practice is described in various ways. One of the most widely used frameworks in Theravada is the Noble Eightfold Path. The Blessed One said, Now what, monks, is the Noble Eightfold Path? Right view, right resolve, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration. The Noble Eightfold Path can also be summarized as the three noble disciplines of sila, moral conduct or discipline, samadhi, meditation or concentration, and panya, understanding or wisdom. Theravada orthodoxy takes the seven stages of purification as outlined in the Visuddhimagga as the basic outline of the path to be followed. The Visuddhimagga, a Sinhalese Theravada doctrinal summa written in the 5th century by Buddhaghosa, became the orthodox account of the Theravada path to liberation in Sri Lanka after the 12th century and this influence spread to other Theravada nations. It gives the sequence of seven purifications, in three sections. The first section part one explains the rules of discipline, and the method for finding a correct temple to practice, or how to meet a good teacher. The second section part two describes samatha calming practice, object by object see Kamatana for the list of the forty traditional objects. It mentions different stages of samadhi. The third section parts three to seven is a description of the five khandas, ayatanas, the four noble truths, dependent origination, and the practice of vipassana insight through the development of wisdom. It emphasizes different forms of knowledge emerging because of the practice. This part shows a great analytical effort specific to Buddhist philosophy. This basic outline is based on the threefold discipline. The emphasis is on understanding the three marks of existence, which removes ignorance. Understanding destroys the ten fetters and leads to nibbana. Theravadins believe that every individual is personally responsible for their own self-awakening and liberation, as they are the ones that were responsible for their own kama actions and consequences. Great emphasis is placed upon applying the knowledge through direct experience and personal realization, than believing about the known information about the nature of reality as said by the Buddha. Topic. Moral conduct Sila, moral conduct, mainly defined as right speech, right action, and right livelihood is primarily understood through the doctrine of Kama. In Theravada, one's present experience is strongly influenced by one's previous intentional actions and whatever actions one intends and then does will have consequences in the future, whether in this life or the next. Intention is central to the idea of kama, actions which are done with good intentions, even if they have bad results, will not result in negative karmic consequences. To guide right action, there are several sets of precepts or moral trainings Traditionally, Theravada laypersons take the five precepts whether for life or for a limited time in front of a monastic after taking refuge in the Three Jewels. Laypeople also sometimes take an extended set of eight precepts which includes chastity during special occasions such as religious holidays. Another important feature of Theravada ethics is the doing of good deeds. Performing these deeds are said to make merit, punya, which will allow one a better rebirth. A common list of good deeds is the ten wholesome actions. Generosity, dana. This is widely done by giving the four requisites to monks: food, clothing, shelter, and medicine. However giving to the needy is also a part of this. Moral conduct sila, keeping the five precepts, generally non-harming. Meditation bhavana. 
transferring merit, doing good deeds in the name of someone who has died or in the name of all beings. Rejoicing in merit of good deeds done by others, this is common in communal activities. Rendering service to others, looking after others. Honoring others, showing appropriate deference, particularly to the Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha, and to seniors and parents. Usually done by place, acing the hands together in Anyali mudra, and sometimes bowing. Preaching Dhamma, the gift of Dhamma is seen as the highest gift. Listening to Dhamma. Having correct views, mainly the Four Noble Truths and the Three Marks of Existence. Topic. Meditation Meditation Pali, bhavana, literally, causing to become, or cultivation means the positive cultivation of one's mind. Topic. Reinvention While often presented as going back to the time of the Buddha, vipassana meditation as popularized by the vipassana movement dates back to the 19th and 20th century. According to Buswell, by the 10th century vipassana was no longer practiced in the Theravada tradition, due to the belief that Buddhism had degenerated, and that liberation was no longer attainable until the coming of Maitreya. It was reintroduced in Myanmar Burma in the 18th century by Madawi a revival of Theravada meditation practice occurred primarily in Myanmar during the 19th and 20th centuries, reinventing vipassana meditation and developing simplified meditation techniques, based on the Satipatthana Sutta, the Visuddhimagga, and other texts, emphasizing Satipatthana and bare insight. These techniques were globally popularized by the Vipassana movement in the second half of the 20th century. Though the Vipassana movement has popularized meditation both in traditional Theravada countries among the laity, and in Western countries, meditation plays a minor if not negligible role in the lives of the majority of Theravada monks. Meditation is especially popular laypersons, especially during special religious holidays or in their old age, when they have more free time to spend at the temple. Buddhist modernists tend to present Buddhism as rational and scientific, and this has also affected how vipassana meditation has been taught and presented. This has led in some quarters to a playing down of older non-empirical elements of Theravada, associated with superstition. Strains of older, traditional Theravada meditation known as Boran Kamatana still exist, but this tradition has mostly been eclipsed by the Buddhist modernist meditation movements. Topic. Techniques, Samatha and Vipassana Theravada Buddhist meditation practice varies considerably in technique and objects. Theravada Buddhist meditation practices or bhavanas cultivations are categorized into two broad categories, Samatha Bhavana calming, and Vipassana Bhavana investigation, insight. Originally these referred to effects or qualities of meditation, but after the time of Buddhahosa, it also referred to two distinct meditation types or paths yana, samatha, calm, consists of meditation techniques in which the mind is focused on a single object, thought, or mantra, leading to samadhi. In traditional Theravada, it is considered to be the base for vipassana, insight. In the Theravada tradition, as early as the Pali Nikayas, the four jhanas are regarded as a samatha practice. The eight and final step of the eightfold path, right samadhi, is often defined as the four jhanas. 
In the Pali Nikayas, jhanas are described as preceding the awakening insight of the Buddha, which turned him into an awakened being. Yet, the interpretation of jhana as single-pointed concentration and calm, may be a later reinterpretation, in which the original aim of jhana was lost. Vipassana meditation was invented in the 19th and 20th century, when monks in Thailand and Burma rejected the sole textual study of Buddhism, and tried to put the texts on meditation into practice. Vipassana applies mindfulness of breathing to calm the mind, focus it on the awareness of chanijing phenomena, and uses this to gain insight into dukkha, anatta, and anicca. Vipassana is also described as insight into dependent origination, the five aggregates, the sense spheres, and the four noble truths. In Western countries, it is complemented with the four divine abidings, the development of loving kindness and compassion. Vipassana practice begins with the preparatory stage, the practice of sila, morality, giving up worldly thoughts and desires. The practitioner then engages in anapanasati, mindfulness of breathing, which is described in the Satipatthana Sutta as going into the forest and sitting beneath a tree and then to simply watch the breath. If the breath is long, to notice that the breath is long, if the breath is short, to notice that the breath is short. In the New Burmese Method the practitioner pays attention to any arising mental or physical phenomenon, engaging in vitaka, noting or naming physical and mental phenomena, breathing, breathing, without engaging the phenomenon with further conceptual thinking. By noticing the arising of physical and mental poenomena, the meditator becomes aware how sense impressions arise from the contact between the senses and physical and mental phenomena, as described in the five skandhas and patikasamuppada. The practitioner also becomes aware of the perpetual changes involved in breathing, and the arising and passing away of mindfulness. This noticing is accompanied by reflections on causation and other Buddhist teachings, leading to insight into dukkha, anatta, and anicca. When the three characteristics have been comprehended, reflection subdues, and the process of noticing accelerates, noting phenomena in general, without necessarily naming them. According to Vajiranana Mahathera, writing from a traditional and text based point of view, in the Pali Canon, whether one begins the practice by way of samatha or by way of vipassana is generally seen as depending on one's temperament. According to Vajiranana Mahathera, it is generally held that there are two kinds of individuals. Those of a passionate disposition or those who enter the path by faith, attain arahatship through vipassana preceded by samatha. Those of a skeptical disposition or those who enter by way of wisdom or the intellect, achieve it through samatha preceded by vipassana. Topic. Aims of meditation Traditionally, the ultimate goal of the practice is to achieve mundane and supramundane wisdom. Mundane wisdom is the insight in the three marks of existence. The development of this insight leads to four supramundane paths and fruits, these experiences consist a direct apprehension of nibbana. Supramundane Lokutra wisdom refers to that which transcends the world of samsara. Apart from nibbana, there are various reasons why traditional Theravada Buddhism advocates meditation, including a good rebirth, supranormal powers, combating fear, and preventing danger. Recent modernist Theravadins have tended to focus on the psychological benefits and psychological well being. Topic. Four stages of enlightenment According to Theravada doctrine, liberation is attained in four stages of enlightenment. Stream enterers, those who have destroyed the first three fetters false view of self, doubt, and clinging to rites and rituals, 
once returners, those who have destroyed the first three fetters and have lessened the fetters of lust and hatred. Non-returners, those who have destroyed the five lower fetters, which bind beings to the world of the senses. Arahants, those who have reached enlightenment, realized nibbana, and have reached the quality of deathlessness are free from all defilements. Their ignorance, craving and attachments have ended. Topic. Nirvana Nirvana Sanskrit, Nirvana Nirvana, Pali, Nibbana Nibbana, Thai, Nifan Nippon is the ultimate goal of Theravadins. It is a state where the fire of the passions has been blown out, and the person is liberated from the repeated cycle of birth, illness, aging and death. In the Samyojanapugala Sutta of the Angatara Nikaya, the Buddha describes four kinds of persons and tells us that the last person, the Arahant, has attained Nibbana by removing all ten fetters that bind beings to samsara in the Arahant. In this person, monks, all of the fetters are gotten rid of that pertain to this world, give rise to rebirth, and give rise to becoming. According to the early scriptures, the nirvana attained by arahants is identical to that attained by the Buddha himself, as there is only one type of nirvana. Theravadins believe the Buddha was superior to arahants because the Buddha discovered the path all by himself and taught it to others i.e., metaphorically turning the wheel of Dhamma. Arahants, on the other hand, attained nirvana partly because of the Buddha's teachings. Theravadins revere the Buddha as a supremely gifted person but also recognize the existence of other such Buddhas in the distant past and future. Maitreya Pali, Medhya, for example, is mentioned very briefly in the Pali Canon as a Buddha who will come in the distant future. Topic. Other practices Laypersons and monks also perform various types of religious practices daily or during Buddhist holidays. One of these is keeping a Buddhist shrine with a picture or statue of the Buddha for devotional practice in one's home, mirroring the larger shrines at temples. It is common to offer candles, incense, flowers and other objects to these shrine. Gestures of respect are also done in front of Buddha images and shrines, mainly the respectful salutation with the hands and the five-limb prostration Vandana. .Buddhist forms of chanting is also widely practiced by both monks and laypersons, who may recite famous phrases such as the taking of refuge, the Metta Sutta and the Mangala Sutta in front of their shrine. Chanting may also be part of the practice of recollection anasati, which refers to contemplating various topics such as the sublime qualities of the Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha or the five subjects for daily recollection. This may be done as part of a daily puja ritual. Another important religious practice for the devout is the keeping of special religious holidays known as Uposatha which are based on a lunar calendar. Laypersons commonly take the eight precepts while visiting a temple or monastery and commit to focusing on Buddhist practice for the day, study of the Buddhist texts and listening to Dhamma talks by monks or teachers are also important practices. Topic. Lay and monastic life Topic. Distinction between lay and monastic life Traditionally, Theravada Buddhism has observed a distinction between the practices suitable for a lay person and the practices undertaken by ordained monks in ancient times, there was a separate body of practices for nuns. 
While the possibility of significant attainment by layman is not entirely disregarded by the Theravada, it generally occupies a position of less prominence than in the Mahayana and Vajrayana traditions, with monastic life being hailed as a superior method of achieving nirvana. The view that Theravada, unlike other Buddhist schools, is primarily a monastic tradition has, however, been disputed. Some Western scholars have erroneously tried to claim that Mahayana is primarily a religion for laymen and Theravada is a primarily monastic religion. Both Mahayana and Theravada have as their foundation strong monastic communities, which are almost identical in their regulations. Schools of Mahayana Buddhism without monastic communities of fully ordained monks and nuns are relatively recent and atypical developments, usually based on cultural and historical considerations rather than differences in fundamental doctrine. Both Mahayana and Theravada also provided a clear and important place for lay followers. This distinction between ordained monks and laypeople, as well as the distinction between those practices advocated by the Pali Canon, and the folk religious elements embraced by many monks, have motivated some scholars to consider Theravada Buddhism to be composed of multiple separate traditions, overlapping though still distinct. Most prominently, the anthropologist Melford Spiro in his work Buddhism and Society separated Burmese Theravada into three groups, Apotropaic Buddhism concerned with providing protection from evil spirits, Kamatic Buddhism concerned with making merit for a future birth, and Nibbanic Buddhism concerned with attaining the liberation of Nirvana, as described in the Tipitaka. He stresses that all three are firmly rooted in the Pali Canon. These categories are not accepted by all scholars, and are usually considered non exclusive by those who employ them. The role of lay people has traditionally been primarily occupied with activities that are commonly termed merit making, falling under Spiro's category of Kamatic Buddhism. Merit-making activities include offering food and other basic necessities to monks, making donations to temples and monasteries, burning incense or lighting candles before images of the Buddha, and chanting protective or merit-making verses from the Pali Canon. Some lay practitioners have always chosen to take a more active role in religious affairs, while still maintaining their lay status. Dedicated lay men and women sometimes act as trustees or custodians for their temples, taking part in the financial planning and management of the temple. Others may volunteer significant time in tending to the mundane needs of local monks by cooking, cleaning, maintaining temple facilities, etc. Lay activities have traditionally not extended to study of the Pali scriptures, nor the practice of meditation, though in the 20th century these areas have become more accessible to the lay community, especially in Thailand. A number of senior monastics in the Thai forest tradition, including Buddhadasa, Ajahn Maha Bua, Ajahn Plian Panyapatipo, Ajahn Pasano, and Ajahn Jayasaro, have begun teaching meditation retreats outside of the monastery for lay disciples. Ajahn Sumido, a disciple of Ajahn Cha, founded the Amravati Buddhist Monastery in Hertfordshire, which has a retreat center specifically for lay retreats. Sumido extended this to Harnam in Northumberland as Aruna Ratanagiri under the present guidance of Ajahn Munindo, another disciple of Ajahn Cha. Lay devotee In Pali the word for a male lay devotee is upasaka and a female devotee is upasaka. One of the duties of the lay followers, as taught by the Buddha, is to look after the needs of the monk, nuns. They are to see that the monk, nuns do not suffer from lack of the four requisites, food, clothing, shelter and medicine. 
As neither monks nor nuns are allowed to have an occupation, they depend entirely on the laity for their sustenance. In return for this charity, they are expected to lead exemplary lives. In Myanmar and Thailand, the monastery was and is still regarded as a seat of learning. In fact today about half of the primary schools in Thailand are located in monasteries. Religious rituals and ceremonies held in a monastery are always accompanied by social activities. In times of crisis, it is to the monks that people bring their problems for counsel. Traditionally, a ranking monk will deliver a sermon four times a month, when the moon waxes and wanes and the day before the new and full moons. The laity also have a chance to learn meditation from the monks during these times. It is also possible for a lay disciple to become enlightened. As Bhikkhu Bodhi notes. The suttas and commentaries do record a few cases of lay disciples attaining the final goal of nirvana. However, such disciples either attain arahantship on the brink of death or enter the monastic order soon after their attainment. They do not continue to dwell at home as arahant householders, for dwelling at home is incompatible with the state of one who has severed all craving. In the modern era, it is now common for lay disciples to practice meditation, attend lay meditation centers, and even aim for awakening. The impetus for this trend began in Myanmar and was supported by Prime Minister Yu Nu who himself established the International Meditation Center in Yangon. Modern lay teachers such as Yu Ba Kin who was also the Accountant General of the Union of Burma promoted meditation as part of a layperson's daily routine. According to Donald K. Swearer, another development in modern Theravada is, "...the formation of lay Buddhist associations that have partially assumed the social service responsibilities formerly associated with the monastery." These include social service and activist organizations such as the Young Men's Buddhist Association of Colombo, the All Salon Buddhist Congress, the Sarvadaya Shramadana of A.T. Araratni, the NGOs founded by Sulak Sivaraksa such as Santi Pracha. <laughs> Monastic vocation Theravada sources dating back to medieval Sri Lanka 2nd century BCE to 10th century CE such as the Mahavamsa show that monastic roles in the tradition were often seen as being in a polarity between urban monks Sinhala, Kamawasi, Pali, Gamavasi on one end and rural forest monks Sinhala, Araniyawasi, Pali, Aranyavasi, Nagaravasi, also known as Tapasi on the other. The ascetic-focused monks were known by the names Pamsukalikas rag -robe wearers and Aranyikas forest dwellers. .The Mahavamsa mentions forest monks associated with the Mahavihara. The Pali Dhammapada commentary mentions another split based on the "...duty of study", and the "...duty of contemplation". This second division has traditionally been seen as corresponding with the city forest split, with the city monks focusing on the vocation of books or learning while the forest monks leaning more towards meditation and practice. However, this opposition is not consistent, and urban monasteries have often promoted meditation while forest communities have also produced excellent scholars, such as the island hermitage of Nyanataloka. Scholar monks generally undertake the path of studying and preserving the Pali literature of the Theravada. Forest monks tend to be the minority among Theravada Sanghas and also tend to focus on asceticism and meditative praxis. 
They view themselves as living closer to the ideal set forth by the Buddha, and are often perceived as such by lay folk, while at the same time often being on the margins of the Buddhist establishment and on the periphery of the social order. While this divide seems to have been in existence for some time in the Theravada school, only in the 10th century is a specifically forest monk monastery, mentioned as existing near Anuradhapura, called Tapavana. This division was then carried over into the rest of Southeast Asia as Theravada spread. Today there are forest-based traditions in most Theravada countries, including the Sri Lankan forest tradition, the Thai forest tradition as well as lesser known forest-based traditions in Burma and Laos, such as the Burmese forest-based monasteries of Pa Ok Sayada. In Thailand, forest monks are known as Phra Thudong ascetic wandering monks or Phra Thudong Kamathan wandering ascetic meditator. Topic: <inaudible> <inaudible> Ordination. The minimum age for ordaining as a Buddhist monk is 20 years, reckoned from conception. However, boys under that age are allowed to ordain as novices Samanera, performing a ceremony such as Shinbyu in Myanmar. Novices shave their heads, wear the yellow robes, and observe the ten precepts. Although no specific minimum age for novices is mentioned in the scriptures, traditionally boys as young as seven are accepted. This tradition follows the story of the Buddha's son, Rahula, who was allowed to become a novice at the age of seven. Monks follow 227 rules of discipline, while nuns follow 311 rules. In most Theravada countries, it is a common practice for young men to ordain as monks for a fixed period of time. In Thailand and Myanmar, young men typically ordain for the retreat during Vasa, the three-month monsoon season, though shorter or longer periods of ordination are not rare. Traditionally, temporary ordination was even more flexible among Laotians. Once they had undergone their initial ordination as young men, Laotian men were permitted to temporarily ordain again at any time, though married men were expected to seek their wife's permission. Throughout Southeast Asia, there is little stigma attached to leaving the monastic life. Monks regularly leave the robes after acquiring an education, or when compelled by family obligations or ill health. Ordaining as a monk, even for a short period, is seen as having many virtues. In many Southeast Asian cultures, it is seen as a means for a young man to repay his parents for their work and effort in raising him, because the merit from his ordination accrues to them as well. Thai men who have ordained as a monk may be seen as more fit husbands by Thai women, who refer to men who have served as monks with a colloquial term meaning, ripe, to indicate that they are more mature and ready for marriage. Particularly in rural areas, temporary ordination of boys and young men traditionally gave peasant boys an opportunity to gain an education in temple schools without committing to a permanent monastic life. In Sri Lanka, temporary ordination is not practiced, and a monk leaving the order is frowned upon. The continuing influence of the caste system in Sri Lanka plays a role in the taboo against temporary or permanent ordination as a bhikkhu in some orders. Though Sri Lankan orders are often organized along caste lines, men who ordain as monks temporarily pass outside of the conventional caste system, and as such during their time as monks may act or be treated in a way that would not be in line with the expected duties and privileges of their caste. Men and women born in Western countries, who become Buddhists as adults, wish to become monks or nuns. 
It is possible, and one can live as a monk or nun in the country they were born in, seek monks or nuns which has gathered in a different western country or move to a monastery in countries like Sri Lanka or Thailand. It is seen as being easier to live a life as a monk or nun in countries where people generally live by the culture of Buddhism, since it is difficult to live by the rules of a monk or a nun in a Western country. For instance, a Theravada monk or nun is not allowed to work, handle money, listen to music, cook and so on, which are extremely difficult rules to live by in cultures which do not embrace Buddhism. Some of the more well-known Theravadan monks are Moon Buridatta, Ajahn Chah, Leti Sayadaw, Webu Sayadaw, Ajahn Pliyan Panyapatipo, Ajahn Sumido, Ajahn Kimadhamo, Ajahn Brahm, Bhikkhu Bodhi, Buddhadasa, Mahasi Sayadaw, Nyanapanika Thera, Praya Maha Gosananda, Upandita, Ajahn Amaro, Ajahn Susito, Thanissaro Bhikkhu, Walpola Rahula, Henapola Gunaratana, Bhante Yogavakara Rahula and Luang Pu Sodh Kandasaro. <laughs> Monastic practices The practices usually vary in different sub-schools and monasteries within Theravada. But in the most orthodox forest monastery, the monk usually models his practice and lifestyle on that of the Buddha and his first generation of disciples by living close to nature in forest, mountains and caves. Forest monasteries still keep alive the ancient traditions through following the Buddhist monastic code of discipline in all its detail and developing meditation in secluded forests. In a typical daily routine at the monastery during the three-month Vasa period, the monk will wake up before dawn and will begin the day with group chanting and meditation. At dawn the monks will go out to surrounding villages bare-footed on alms round and will have the only meal of the day before noon by eating from the bowl by hand. Most of the time is spent on Dhamma study and meditation. Sometimes the abbot or a senior monk will give a Dhamma talk to the visitors. Laity who stay at the monastery will have to abide by the traditional eight Buddhist precepts. The life of the monk or nun in a community is much more complex than the life of the forest monk. In the Buddhist society of Sri Lanka, most monks spend hours every day in taking care of the needs of lay people such as preaching bana, accepting alms, officiating funerals, teaching dhamma to adults and children in addition to providing social services to the community. After the end of the Vasa period, many of the monks will go out far away from the monastery to find a remote place usually in the forest where they can hang their umbrella tents and where it is suitable for the work of self-development. When they go wandering, they walk barefoot, and go wherever they feel inclined. Only those requisites which are necessary will be carried along. These generally consist of the bowl, the three robes, a bathing cloth, an umbrella tent, a mosquito net, a kettle of water, a water filter, razor, sandals, some small candles, and a candle lantern. The monks do not fix their times for walking and sitting meditation, for as soon as they are free they just start doing it, nor do they determine for how long they will go on to meditate. Some of them sometimes walk from dusk to dawn whereas at other times they may walk from between two and seven hours. Some may decide to fast for days or stay at dangerous places where ferocious animals live in order to aid their meditation. Those monks who have been able to achieve a high level of attainment will be able to guide the junior monks and lay Buddhists toward the four degrees of spiritual attainment. Topic: Bhikkhunis. 
A few years after the arrival of Mahinda, the Bhikkhu Sangamita, who is also believed to have been the daughter of Ashoka, came to Sri Lanka. She ordained the first nuns in Sri Lanka. In 429, by request of China's emperor, nuns from Anuradhapura were sent to China to establish the order there, which subsequently spread across East Asia. The Pratimoksa of the nuns' order in East Asian Buddhism is the Dharmaguptaka, which is different than the Pratimoksa of the current Theravada school. The specific ordination of the early Sangha in Sri Lanka not known, although the Dharmaguptaka sect originated with the Stavriya as well. The nuns' order subsequently died out in Sri Lanka in the 11th century and in Burma in the 13th century. It had already died out around the 10th century in other Theravadan areas. Novice ordination has also disappeared in those countries. Therefore, women who wish to live as renunciates in those countries must do so by taking eight or ten precepts. Neither laywomen nor formally ordained, these women do not receive the recognition, education, financial support or status enjoyed by Buddhist men in their countries. These precept holders live in Myanmar, Cambodia, Laos, Nepal, and Thailand. In particular, the Governing Council of Burmese Buddhism has ruled that there can be no valid ordination of women in modern times, though some Burmese monks disagree. Japan is a special case as, although it has neither the bhikkhuni nor novice ordinations, the precept-holding nuns who live there do enjoy a higher status and better education than their precept-holder sisters elsewhere, and can even become Zen priests. In Tibet there is currently no bhikkhuni ordination, but the Dalai Lama has authorized followers of the Tibetan tradition to be ordained as nuns in traditions that have such ordination. In 1996, 11 selected Sri Lankan women were ordained fully as Theravada bhikkhunis by a team of Theravada monks in concert with a team of Korean nuns in India. There is disagreement among Theravada Vinaya authorities as to whether such ordinations are valid. The Dambulla chapter of the Siam Nikaya in Sri Lanka also carried out a nun's ordination at this time, specifically stating their ordination process was a valid Theravadan process where the other ordination session was not. This chapter has carried out ordination ceremonies for hundreds of nuns since then. This has been criticized by leading figures in the Siam Nikaya and Amrapura Nikaya, and the Governing Council of Buddhism in Myanmar has declared that there can be no valid ordination of nuns in modern times, though some Burmese monks disagree with this. In 1997, Dhamma Siddhya Vihara in Boston was founded by Ven. Gotami of Thailand, then a ten precept nun, when she received full ordination in 2000, her dwelling became America's first Theravada Buddhist bhikkhuni vihara. A 55 year old Thai Buddhist eight precept white robed Meishi nun, Varangana Vanavachayan, became the first woman to receive the going forth ceremony of a Theravada novice and the gold robe in Thailand, in 2002. On February 28, 2003, Dhammananda Bhikkhuni, formerly known as Chatsamarn Kabilsingh, became the first Thai woman to receive Bhikkhuni ordination as a Theravada nun. Dhammananda Bhikkhuni was ordained in Sri Lanka. The Thai Senate has reviewed and revoked the secular law passed in 1928 banning women's full ordination in Buddhism as unconstitutional for being counter to laws protecting freedom of religion. However Thailand's two main Theravada Buddhist orders, the Mahanakaya and Dhammayudaka Nikaya, have yet to officially accept fully ordained women into their ranks. In 2009 in Australia four women received bhikkhuni ordination as Theravada nuns, the first time such ordination had occurred in Australia. 
It was performed in Perth, Australia, on the 22nd of October 2009 at Badanyana Monastery. Abbas Vyama together with Venerables Naroda, Seri, and Hasapana were ordained as bhikkhunis by a dual Sangha act of bhikkhus and bhikkhunis in full accordance with the Pali Vinaya. In 2010, in the U.S., four novice nuns were given the full bhikkhuni ordination in the Thai Theravada tradition, which included the double ordination ceremony. Henapola Gunaratana and other monks and nuns were in attendance. It was the first such ordination ever in the Western Hemisphere, the first bhikkhuni ordination in Germany. The ordination of German woman Samaneri Dira occurred on June 21, 2015, at Anenja Vihara, in Indonesia, the first Theravada ordination of bhikkhunis in Indonesia after more than a thousand years occurred in 2015 at Wisma Kusalayani in Lembong, Bandung in West Java. Those ordained included Vajiradevi Sadika Bhikkhuni from Indonesia, Meta Bhikkhuni from Sri Lanka, Anula Bhikkhuni from Japan, Santasuka Santamana Bhikkhuni from Vietnam, Suki Bhikkhuni and Sumangala Bhikkhuni from Malaysia, and Genti Bhikkhuni from Australia. <laughs> Monastic orders within Theravada Theravada monks typically belong to a particular Nikaya, variously referred to as monastic orders or fraternities. These different orders do not typically develop separate doctrines, but may differ in the manner in which they observe monastic rules. These monastic orders represent lineages of ordination, typically tracing their origin to a particular group of monks that established a new ordination tradition within a particular country or geographic area. In Sri Lanka caste plays a major role in the division into Nikayas. Some Theravada Buddhist countries appoint or elect a Sangharaha, or Supreme Patriarch of the Sangha, as the highest ranking or seniormost monk in a particular area, or from a particular Nikaya. The demise of monarchies has resulted in the suspension of these posts in some countries, but patriarchs have continued to be appointed in Thailand. Myanmar and Cambodia ended the practice of appointing a Sangharaha for some time, but the position was later restored, though in Cambodia it lapsed again. Bangladesh Sangharaj Nikaya Mahasthabir Nikaya Myanmar, Myanmar Thudhama Nikaya Shwekian Nikaya H. Getwan Nikaya Dwara Nikaya Sri Lanka Siam Nikaya Rihanna Malwatha Asgariya Watarawila or Mahavihara Vamshika Shyamapali Vanavasa Nikaya Amrapura Nikaya has many sub orders including Dharmarakshitha Kanduboda or Swejan Nikaya Tapavana or Kalyanavamsa Ramanya Nikaya Sri Kalyani Yogasrama Samsta or Galdua tradition Deldua Thailand and Cambodia Maha Nikaya Dhamayudika Nikaya Topic Festivals and Customs Magga Puja Vesaka Puja Asala Puja Uposata Vasa Rain Retreat Topic Demographics Theravada Buddhism is followed by countries and people around the globe and as in South Asia Nepal Sri Lanka by 70% of the population 
Bangladesh by 0.7% of the population mainly in Chittagong Hill Tracts and Kuakata, Barishal. India, traditional Theravada mainly in seven sister states In Southeast Asia Cambodia by 95% of the population Laos by 67% of the population Myanmar by 89% of the population Thailand by 90% of the population, 94% of the population that practices religion. Vietnam by the Khmer Krom in the south and central parts of Vietnam and Thai Dam in northern Vietnam. Malaysia in peninsular Malaysia, especially northwestern parts of Malaysia, primarily by the Malaysian Siamese and Malaysian Sinhalese. Indonesia Singapore In East Asia China mainly by the Shan, Thai, Dai, Hani, Hua, Acheng, Blang ethnic groups mainly in Yunnan province Theravada has also recently gained popularity in the Western world. Today, Theravada Buddhists, otherwise known as Theravadins, number over 150 million worldwide, and during the past few decades, Theravada Buddhism has begun to take root in the West and in the Buddhist revival in India. Topic. See also. equals equals notes